injury attorneys at The Advocates can't actually prevent you from being in a cycling accident. They will be by your side to support you following your accident. Our legal services won't cost you a dime out of pocket. So when you need an injury attorney, call us. We're The Advocates, your Utah personal injury attorneys. You didn't deserve to be in an accident, but you do deserve an advocate. This is The Monty Show, the truth in sports talk streaming. When you want unbiased opinions about your favorite team without the spin, all you have to do is find The Monty Show, streaming live and available 24 hours a day, seven days a week on YouTube. And now, here's Monty. Hello, friends. The Monty Show is live on your YouTube machine. Happy Tuesday. We are less than a week away from tax day. Hope it is prosperous for you as always we are presented by the advocates the advocates.com the best injury attorneys in the business I tell you every day they're working in your communities they care about the people they serve which is why you never pay the advocates out of pocket that's right you don't pay the advocates unless and until they win your case you can chat with an attorney live online at the advocates.com 24 7 365 and it won't cost you a dime at theadvocates.com. A lot to get to today. Hello. Uh, thank you guys for being here in all seriousness. Um, couldn't do the show without you guys. We appreciate you subscribing as we are uh, rocketing towards 100,000 subscribers on this uh, here little humble channel. Uh, 89,571, just about to crack uh, 90,000 in the next few weeks or so. Uh, could be fun. Could by the end of the year, we could be at 100,000 subscribers on the little old Bonnie show. Uh, so we appreciate, uh, well, some of you, not most of you, uh, you know. So uh, who's first in this morning before we uh, get into arguing about one of the stupidest things Jake has ever said, ever in the history of the world? Uh, Mike Smith first went in this morning. Mike, good morning to you. Hope you had a great uh, 79th birthday. Pete Forte, Hello. Caps Lock Friday Cougar. Caps Lock Fry Cougar. Okay. Uh, I thought the world was supposed to end. Now I'm broke. Come on, prize picks. Hey, three for three on prize picks last night, including Zach Eady. Um, fucking Cubs won. last night. Anybody see the Cubs last night? Up eight, nothing. Uh, you, Darvish, um, get shelled by his former team. Uh, and then Fernando, I like steroids, Tatis. Uh, hits a bomb and the Cubs lose nine eight, eight nothing, eight nothing, and <clears throat> don't get me started. Don't get me started. And then there's Jake being stupid, as which I guess really shouldn't be surprising. Uh, you want to run back your take on Zach Eady from last night? Yeah, I mean everybody wants to say, oh man, this guy had a huge night. This guy had a great game. You know, he he delivered. Uh, and I'm here to say that I don't think he did. I think the numbers, he had a nice night on the stat sheet, but routinely turning it over when his job was to kick it out to the wing player, uh, uh, routinely getting beat in his matchup. Uh, I would say Purdue overall offensively last night, uh, was not up to the task. I think UConn simply did a better job defensively, uh, controlling them. And, and, and I think that the, the issue is I'm watching this game in the first half and what do we see? UConn's controlling the pace of play. You don't have the dynamic at play where Edie's a force and they got to collapse on him and then he can kick it out. I actually thought he was dominant in the first half. He is not somebody that is a kickout guy. Uh, Zach Edie, I thought in the second half, looked very nervous. Airballed a free throw, which obviously at that point is when he kind of relaxed and started dominating again. But you don't put up the numbers he put up last night um, the guy is, is arguably the, the most dominant non-wing player in college basketball. Uh, I thought, I thought he was fine when you, when you, it, it, and I don't know that they shot a number three, it'd have to go back uh, another three pointer. At one point they were one of five with, I think five minutes left in the game. Mm -hmm. I believe they were one of five from three. Zach Eady is the last guy to point to be pointing the finger at. Zach Eady is a guy that I thought dominated. Um, now, obviously, it would have been, you know, probably better. 
uh, if he would have dominated the entire game, uh, but he did not. And I say, I say Purdue choked last night. Zach Eady did not choke last night. Purdue choked last night. And looking at the uh, looking at the final numbers, uh, yeah, they were one of seven from three for the entire game. For the entire game. Now, UConn was six of 22. UConn made just about as many threes as Purdue took all mm-hmm. night long. Uh, you cannot, in my opinion, you cannot take seven total threes in a game, make one, and expect to win. And I think that Zach Eady with 37 points and 10 rebounds did not choke. He did. He was not the problem. I think that they just looked like the moment was too big for them. In the first, I don't know, 10, 15, 17, the entire second half, of Zach Eady looked a little nervous. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that was kind of the vibe of Purdue last night. I mean, they just looked tight. They looked they looked uncomfortable. And 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 I don't think I, I mean we all agree that UConn was a, a a phenomenal defensive team heading into this game. I mean, it's no secret that those guys know how to play quality team defense in a variety of different schemes. But I, but it just was, I don't know. The stat sheet said that dude had a big night. I'm not saying that the stat sheet is saying, I'm not saying he had a crap game. What I'm saying is that the dynamic of Edie is a force down low and the defense as a unit has to go and, and, and gravitate to him, which then creates all these nice open looks, was not at play last night. And that's not all on Edie, but I just felt like, hey, man, this is the game you live and die for as a basketball player. Yeah, you had 37 and 10. You had a, a great game on the stat sheet. I totally agree with that. But I just been watching this game and I'm like, man, like if if Purdue, the adjustment I was hoping for in the second half out of Purdue was go out, feed E and get UConn into foul trouble. Get into the bonus, slow the game down, control the clock, and you can get back to it. I thought they did that. I thought I thought there was no doubt that um, you know, Samson Johnson came in. He got those lobs, but he was also, he also fouled out. He was in foul trouble. Um, And I think there's no doubt that uh, Klingon was the same thing. Um, He was, he was a, he was a slight factor, but I think the bigger issue was that you, Zach Eady only had 10 boards because they just didn't shoot the ball. Yeah. I mean, it's remarkable that they, they only took 54 shots to UConn 62 that Purdue only had two points off the two points off the bench. Yeah. That's yeah. it. And you scored 60 total and you got two points off the bench. He had 37 of your 60. He was he was not the problem. I think I UConn was better last night. I don't I don't believe that talent wise or schematics that UConn was just a dominant team last night. They looked like a team who had been there before, and this was just another game for them. That's what it looked like to me. They looked smooth, comfortable. They moved the ball. I thought the trap that they ran mm-hmm. was really good. Like I just think that I think UConn played their game better than Purdue did. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I mean, I, I think that, that that experience from last year obviously helps a lot. You know, I mean, there, there's a certain calmness about UConn that you can't you're not going to be able to replicate that feeling on your team unless you've been there and you've done it before. And so that was definitely a play last night. I guess, you know, I think, you know, the the other thing is UConn deserves a lot of credit for 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 being consistent. I, I mean, I, I think it, it takes a lot to play the kind of defense they play. I mean, every yeah. time you came up to set a pick, the guy went over the pick and was right on you. And he was getting consistent help. And then they were not, because that was the other thing on the offensive end for Purdue. You were trying to run your usual pick and roll, but you couldn't get it to him. You couldn't get it to Edie most of the time because they were they were playing really good team defense and rotating quickly. So, I, I, look, I'm not saying it's all Edie's fault. I guess my point just is, is that, is that I, at certain points of this game, to me, UConn was just, was just, Dominant. However, you want to describe that, whether it's their better team or it was just last night. Yeah, whatever. but I, I, you look at Purdue like on a layup, it, on multiple occasions, you miss the rim. On a layup, you hit the side of the backboard. On a driving layup, 
Multiple times, Purdue players hit the side of the backboard. Yeah. Zach Eady airballed a free throw and then almost airballed another one. That's being tight. That's being nervous. You choked. Plain and simple. Is, is UConn a better team? Yes, they're back-to-back -back national champions. This isn't about UConn. UConn played their game. The most difficult thing for, for coaches and teams to do in these situations is just get your guys to play game, play their game. Part of the brilliance of, of Dan Hurley is that his guys played their game, and they have for two years. He's a He is a phenomenal head coach. This is not a conversation about UConn. It's a conversation about uh, Purdue just not showing up last night, yeah. not being ready to compete not being able to calm themselves on a big stage. Like you look at, yes, was the press and the defense and absolutely what UConn did it impacted Purdue. That doesn't make you shoot air balls from the free throw line. That does not make you air ball layups. It, how do you explain multiple players air balling layups? Yeah. You're I, tight. Yeah. You're nervous. No you're doubt. scared. No doubt about it. Passing on open threes. You're tight. You're scared. Like that's the that's the worst part of games like this is like at least Iowa, South Carolina, you were throwing blows. Like that was a close game. You know, like UConn, we can argue about uh screens, illegal screens. UConn in Iowa was a slug fest. This was a scrimmage for UConn men because Purdue didn't show up. That's the disappointing part. And I think there is a bigger conversation this morning about how successful and how compelling the men's tournament was versus the women's tournament. Because I think the women's tournament with the Caitlin Clark, Paige Becker storyline with, a, you know, the, the, the ridiculous $5,000 Louis suit worn by the championship coach, whose name I will never, ever again say on this show, um, I think the women's tournament was far more compelling. I think the audiences in the women's game were are going to be far larger. And if anybody wants to explain to me why the NCAA tournament is on TNT instead of CBS, I'm here for it. I, I, I do not understand it. Some of the technical problems they had last night, and maybe I'm the only asshole who's going to say this. I have no idea. I'm... I. The the inside the NBA crew needs to go back to the NBA. Find some college guys. Mm -hmm. Send Charles Barkley and Kenny Smith back to the NBA. I, I it, it's overexposure. I don't know what it is. I'm tired of hearing from those guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that they are, you know, that inside the NBA crew is is clearly overexposed. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they they use them for everything they possibly can, and the issue is is that the secondary inside the NBA crew is garbage. It's terrible. I, I, I don't like the combination of those folks. And so what you end up getting is Kenny and Charles and that whole group doing everything under the sun. And, and at some point, and I don't care Brutal. who you are, I don't care what sport you played, I don't care how long you've been playing it, as a broadcaster, at some point you find your limitation, and that limitation often shows itself when you're trying to talk about college basketball players that you don't know as much about. It just is the reality. Like, the brilliance of Charles Barkley on a, on a TV set is that he has experience with these guys. He knows these dudes. He can talk about, you know, intimate conversations. And he's phenomenal on the NBA. Yeah. I, I, I love Kenny and Charles on the NBA. I love Shaq and EJ on the NBA. I don't like them at all. And, and maybe I'm biased in this light. Give me the ESPN guys. Where is fucking Jay Billis? Yeah. Where Where is the best of the best college basketball analysts? Where, where, like Jay Wright is fine, but where are where are the best of the best? That's what I count on CBS for in college basketball. Like I need, I miss Billy Pat. The days of Billy Packer and Jim Nance. Like I actually found myself missing Jim Nance last night on college basketball. Mm -hmm. I get it. Jim is a thousand years old. We've talked about this with him and Tony Romo. I get it. But this whole inside the NBA thing doing college basketball, can we never do that again? Yeah, I, I, it just doesn't work. And and I and I think the the really interesting thing is like you know what you were kind of getting at there at the women's game. Like the women's game, I believe 
you know, clearly carried the ter- both tournaments this year. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not so sure that that if Caitlin Clark wasn't around, that we really would be that invested in this year's tournament. I mean, you're, you're talking about like, okay, Angel Reese, I guess, um, you know, Edie clearly, you know, but those are the names you're looking at. I mean, it, it, so so without the heat of Caitlin Clark versus the world, I, I'm not sure that we'd all be plugged in and even yeah. concerning ourselves with the fact that the inside the NBA crew got overexposed last night. <laughs> like, that's the crazy part about it. Yeah, it, it makes me crazy. That when you have guys like Jay Billis, Jay Billis and Seth Greenberg, and we wind up with Charles Barkley talking college basketball, it's just not what he's good at. And I, I, I so my whole point was, I thought the women's tournament, this is the first time I think in history, and I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty certain this will be the first time in history, the women's tournament outdraws the men's tournament and TV audience. Like and Impressive. it's it's gonna be a pretty big gap, I think. Part of that is again, it's on TNT and oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. It was on True TV. We interrupt this men's championship game for highlights <laughs> of the solar eclipse. Thank you. We we interrupt this men's NCAA tournament final where a dynasty is being crowned for like a story about some dude who fell out of a ceiling in a convenience store while trying to rob it. Isn't that what's on true TV? Like yeah. cops on live on the streets with cops. Live PD. Right. Like, what are we doing? CBS, put it on CBS. Can we get channel Two college basketball, please? And thank you. Yeah. And can Jay Billis and Seth Greenberg and you know, yeah. The usuals. Yeah. Congratulations, Dan Hurley and, and what he's built at Connecticut. They, they, I think there's a real chance that they three-peat. Now, this John Calipari story is very interesting. And yes, we're going to get to the, the – we have some really good information on the, on the Super League coming up. We're going to get to that. But I think it's really interesting who's going to be the next head coach at Kentucky. And will we finally get John Calipari to Arkansas today? Now, we're told that'll happen today. But I think the far more interesting story is who takes the Kentucky job? Because I think Nate Oates was probably, probably the best candidate. If you were just, okay, there's an opening. Who are the best candidates? Nate Oates. Right. Absolutely not. Puts out a statement yesterday, essentially go to hell, Kentucky. Okay. Okay. I I get it. Dan Hurley. If I'm if I have a uh, a major college basketball opening, probably going to reach out to Dan Hurley. He said, "Yeah, that's a no, absolutely not." I believe was the words he used. Okay, Jay Wright. Yeah, absolutely not. No, that's a I'm a no. And all of a sudden, you're like, okay, uh, Billy Donovan. Uh, but I mean, you're trying to find somebody now. It feels like. Because all the top guys are, it's a no for me. I'm a no. That's a no for me, bro. Uh-huh. I'm out. So now you start wondering um, who's who's going to take that job. Are you going to fall all the way down to Tommy Lloyd at Arizona? Is that are you are are you are you going to fall to a guy who's never left the West Coast of the United States of America? I don't believe that Tommy Lloyd has ever been in his entire life. I could be wrong. Right. Arizona basketball coach Tommy Lloyd, I don't believe, has ventured over to Rocky Mountains. <laughs> Obviously, that's not true. But he's he's a West Coast guy. Are you really going to – if you hire Tommy Lloyd, how desperate are you? Well, and, and I think if you compare the Kentucky basketball job to the Alabama football job, what's the key difference here in, in trying to go out and get a candidate? The key difference is that Alabama football was the best job in football, and it just came available. And now Kentucky is no longer the best job in college basketball. And it's been some time since you've done anything at Kentucky. You, and you've waited too long. You better hope. You had better hope that Scott Scott Drew is willing to answer the phone. If you are Mitch Barnhart in Lexington, I think aren't you? I I mean, I would think Scott Drew now with Nate Davis out, like with with Dan Hurley laughing at you and 
Jay Wright on national TV laughing at you. Like, don't you have to hope and pray that I would guess I have heard Billy Donovan from the Bulls a lot linked to that job, was an assistant there, but turned it down all those years ago when he had a chance to take it. Now he has talked about publicly and privately. I mean, he clearly has a passion for the college game still. But aren't you hoping that Scott Drew picks up the phone? Like, aren't you hoping that if you look at if you look at his record at Baylor and what he's done, he's been there. Do you guys understand he's been there 20 years, which is wild. But the things he's accomplished at Baylor, yes, I don't know how he's not the guy. And you're going to get decimated because without question, I think John Calipari now has the NIL money that he was so frustratingly without at Kentucky. He's going to take his recruiting class with him. Why wouldn't you? Right. Yeah. Because he's got, you can say a lot of things about Cal. That dude knows how to get high school kids to come to Kentucky. And I would guess he's going to be able to with the NIL money he has now, supposedly, at Arkansas, he's going to be able to get his recruiting class to come in because he's got one of the top five classes in the country. So you're going to go to Kentucky and you're going to be handcuffed. You're not probably going to have the resources that you would ideally want. And you're going to be starting from ground zero with not a lot of talent. Yeah, and yeah, that's tough. I, 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 that's why I think you need to find someone who's shown the ability to build a program. You know, shown the ability to start mm. from nothing and understands the NIL landscape. And 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 frankly, for Kentucky, like you're gonna have to you're gonna have to get comfortable with having an NIL budget because again, like I, I'm not gonna sit here and say that John is blameless for their struggles. But certainly not having a robust NIL Hmm. budget is killing you in college basketball. I think that's why Scott Drew has to be the guy. I mean, I can't imagine a – who's another great – a Mark Few leaving Gonzaga. I can't imagine – I mean, Dan Hurley's – I mean, he's about to three-peat. Are you telling me where he's got a chance at three? Come on. Yeah. I mean – it. The reason I say Scott Drew is because you're going to have to have somebody go in there that's got a pipeline built already. And you're just going to point that pipeline from fucking Waco to Lexington, right? Yeah. Like, because you don't have, you're not going to have talent there. Calipari's going to take his dudes. And you're going to have to have somebody that's got experience, that's got a coaching pu- staff and a pipeline, and can say, hey, you know, instead of going to Baylor, why don't you come on up to Kentucky? Let's revive the greatness in the Bluegrass State. Yeah. Like, that's a story that I can tell. That's a product I can sell, right? The old sales acumen. That's a story I can tell with a product I can sell. And I think that's exactly why Scott Drew has to be the guy yeah. at Kentucky. But I this is very interesting. I think there's also a little drama around John Calipari's deal not being finalized yet. And all of the the uh, message board hyenas are out there saying, well, he's trying to stay at Kentucky. He's not trying to stay at Kentucky. No. That deal is done. Um, there's a uh, there's a massive booster that John Calipari has long ties to, uh, the Tyson family, the chicken, massive people. Um, I mean, he's got major donors at Arkansas, the major donor at Arkansas, He's going to have a, a massive collective pot there. He's going to he's going to Arkansas. You're 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 going to save money uh, if you are Kentucky on his buyout, which is thirty whatever million. You, you better hope that Scott Drew is willing to answer the phone. Well, and I think the good news in college basketball is you can turn things around quickly. I mean, you 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 don't have this dynamic at play where it's going to take you three four years to to like, you know, even be in the college football playoff, right? Like it's college basketball. You just got to get back into the tournament, you know, and start making progress. And if, you know, if you hire someone and they can get you to the sweet 16 in year one, let's say at Kentucky, uh, I think that's a pretty good win. I would say. Yeah. I, I also wonder about Shaka smart at Marquette. I mean, obviously he's bounced around a little bit. Um, but can anybody argue with what he did at VCU? Can anybody argue with what he's done at Marquette? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, he's a really good recruiter. 
I don't know that Shaka Smart's the name that's big enough. Scott Drew is a home run. Nobody's going to bat an eye. They're just going to get out the checkbook and fill the collective. Yeah. Shaka Smart's a risk. Shaka Smart is a is a risk. And I think Tommy Lloyd is an absolute bust if you're Kentucky. If you fall all the way down, if you fall all the way down to Tommy Lloyd at our Arizona, holy cow, dude. You're you're in a terrible spot. Yeah. But to put a bow around the NCAA tournament, as you hit the like button right here on the Monty show. I think that you we're going to get a women's tournament that outdraws a men's tournament for the first time ever. And I don't know that that's a good thing for college basketball. I do not. All right, real quick, let's get uh, your thoughts on college basketball. Um, boy, good job in the comments section today. Let's see. Toesucker69. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Christopher Shannon, good morning. 37 of 60 points, two holes. What else is Edie supposed to contribute? Yeah, it's not about the stat sheet, though. That's what that's what nobody seems to get their hands around in this game. Of course he's going to put up a big game. It's a national championship game. The issue was the dynamic inside the offense was the not vibe. there. The, the vibe. Like, the vibe, the flow. The like, dominance. Like, you were chasing UConn all night, dude. That's all you were doing, offense and defense. I think Edie played fine. It was not his... Now, listen, he won me on prize picks. He won me on prize picks. 3-3 last night, walked away with $105. Pimp's going to pimp, right? Now, right. I can afford the I can afford the asshole suit that South Carolina's head coach has. Right, that's the kind of bread I'm rolling in because of Prize Picks. PrizePicks.com. Use the promo code Monty. Uh, you know, listen, that's just the reality yeah. of things. But I think that Zach Eady last night and his Purdue teammates were not here for it. They were not. You, dude, you got to have balls to go out there and 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 perform at a very high level in that situation. UConn did it. Purdue did not. I'm not even ready to say that. Oh man, like a certain ass hat on this show. Was texting me, man. UConn's just better. They you, looked better. They looked you, prepared. They, UConn, they were... UConn was more prepared. UConn was ready for the moment. They looked like they were just playing another game in LA Fitness. By the way, how many right? little, how many little over the left shoulder hook shots did Edie miss last night? Right. And my point is, they weren't able to handle the pressure. They weren't. They realized that they were playing for a national championship. UConn was there just playing another basketball game. That's what it looked like. That was the vibe. You don't shoot air balls on free throws. Yeah. When you're not choking on a D in the national championship game, you don't miss to your point, a shot you've made a hundred. I would, how many of those hook shots you think that kid's put in the bucket in his, in his Dude, life? It's gotta be thousands? close to half a million. Yeah. Oh no. In practice games, high school, yeah. yeah. the backyard, the basement on a nerf hoop, at least half a million. He almost shot an air ball on a baby hook in the in the the second half. They weren't here for it. I again, not to be redundant, you're shooting air balls on layups. You hit the backboard and miss the fucking rim yeah. on a layup. You weren't here for it. UConn was ready. Purdue was not. That simple. Dakota Tubbs, hello. UConn had the depth of talent advantage last night, and it showed. Purdue looked gassed in the second. And I, I do think that there is some legitimacy, much to your credit, Dakota. I think there is some legitimacy to the fact that Purdue's guards were playing over their head this entire run. They never had the better guard play T from a talent side. Yeah. Again, to your, your point, for once, you make a decent yeah, know, point. For once, yeah. For once. Yeah. The stat sheet almost is never the truth teller. Their guards were always not as talented, not as athletic. Purdue's guards, not as talented, not as athletic, not as able. Last night, I think we might have seen that. Yeah, I think we might have. We we may well have seen that. Uh, Eric and Raleigh, hello. Purdue colluded with Shohei to take the under. Well, you know, I, I mean, if Ipe was around last night, you know. Uh, RJC loaner phone. Uh, our, let's see what kind of day you're here for. Because you usually choose violence. How's that Apple loaner phone thing working? <laughs> again, I don't know if you know. No, I'm not going to. No. Defense created those misfires. Okay, so wait. 
No, I'm just asking for my fucking friend of mine who doesn't know shit about <laughs> no. basketball. How much defense are they playing on the free throw line? Hmm. Well, I was told that that it's like in your jersey defense. But last night it was a wide open but look isn't from the it, free isn't throw it line. Called a free um, throw. Um last time I checked, you can't play zone defense on a free throw. Last time I checked, you can't pressure a free throw. Last time I checked, you can't run a trap against a free throw. I'm unfamiliar with it. I mean, I know. Listen, hey, I understand you're the Apple expert here, RJC, man, not me. I'm not too familiar with that. Last time I checked, you ain't getting no loaner phone on the free throw line. Stay hard. So let me get this right. Their defense was so good at UConn that Zach Eady shot an air ball on a free throw. Hmm. Uh, I mean, hey, that's, that's logic. Uh, listen. Again, you prove um, your awesomeness, and I don't. I'm not on your level, sir. I mean, I'm just over here. I actually pay full freight for my phone, and know. I don't have one when it's getting fixed. I'm like you. You're special. Apple gives you loaner That's phones right. and stuff. That's right. And you apparently invented the the iPhone like 30 <coughs> years ago. But you know, you do you, uh, which you know, which is fine. Uh, Christopher Shannon, Purdue guards were finally exposed for their lack of talent. Totally agree. They just don't have a, a, a talented enough guards. It's Purdue. Nobody wants to go to West Lafayette. Yeah. Nobody. I did a nickel upstate in West Lafayette for like three months one year. Never again. Mike Smith, Mountain Mama. Seriously, hope you had a good birthday. Number of Big 12, 10 ACC and SEC teams in the tourney, and UConn from the Big East wins again. Yep. Dan Hurley's a stud, dude. I'm telling you. I'm for real. Uh, Eric and Raleigh per didn't exactly right. Right. Get it per do. It's like do and didn't. It all works together. Yin and yang and stuff. You know. They, you know. You know. Um. Let's see. Moth prof. UConn eventually to the ACC or the Big Twelve. I would think at some point, but I don't know. We'll see. When we talk about the uh, the college football super league here in ten minutes. You that still be a big part of that for sure. Give me Jay Billis on the NCAA games, yes. please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh RJC man, I love Charles. Well, not liking that take. Charles Barkley is terrible on college basketball. Yeah. Shouldn't be doing it. By the way, anybody see the video last night where after the game, Charles is trying to shake the Purdue players' hands as they walk off, and like half of them are just walking by him, not shaking his hand. And Zach Eady, to his credit, said he appreciated that. And he did stop and talk to Charles for about three seconds. But, yeah, I did see that. Uh, Dakota, 100%. The NBA crew shouldn't have been out there. Times like this, I miss Dickie V. Oh, the old yeah. Dickie V. I agree with that. Seth Greenberg and Jay Billis. Okay, let's move on. That's it. That's like the whole thing. It's not rocket science. It's the whole thing. Bring Coach K. Bring in Coach K instead. I could see doing that. Uh, Mike Smith, I can watch Charles and Shaq on YouTube for hours and laugh the whole time, but I do think they should bring in college announcers. Totally agree. That's exactly right. Like, I don't mind Shaq and a fool. I don't mind them knocking Shaq into a Christmas tree. I don't mind them do all the things that, you know, inside the NBA is legendary for. But they're not good on college basketball. Yeah. It's, it's uncomfortable. Uh, Billis is great. Yes, he is. Uh, let's see. Mike Smith, I would not want to watch NFL game guys calling college football either. Yeah. Kirk Herbstreet calling NFL games. Awkward. Yes. See what I'm saying? Big Daddy Magic. Hello. Oh, oh, hey, player. Victor would have dominated the whole night last night, okay? Let's see if you're right. Hey, Victor's player. Away. Damn it. The University of Purdue let me down. I guarantee I will get my revenge. Victor's coming for Zach's ass. Zach's okay. ass. Okay. You know. Uh, Caps Lock Fry Coog. Does CBS not want to pay for top college analysts? Just use talent they already have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the game call was fine. Yeah. Bill Raftery um, talks too much. Shulman and Billis. Shulman's good. I, I don't mind Raftery. I don't mind him as a, as a color guy. Send it in, Jerome. Right? Uh, it is TNT caps lock, but they should be able to find young talent for the NCAA ranks. Well, TNT and CBS, right? It's like same family. I just don't know why. I don't know why you, why you wouldn't. Uh, Boss Frog, hello. Hi, J2H. Hey, bud. How are you? 
the Canadian played his normal game. His stat line last night was aligned with his season averages. For the last four years, blame should not be squarely on Edie. He did what was expected. Well, God forbid he did what was he was expected to do. Ne- wouldn't want to, you know, excel. Wouldn't want to, you know, carry your team. I mean, you know, I, I'm just <laughs> simply saying everyone wants to be nice to this cat today, and it's cool. It's he, cool, dude. He was not the problem. Right, but he also wasn't the solution. We can sit here and say, hey, oh, it's not all an Edie. Okay, cool. If so they, it's all Edie when it's going good. Let me ask you this. 37 and 10 he puts up. Mm-hmm. If they shoot five more threes and they go O of five more, so they're one of one of 13. Right. He's got 40 points and probably 13 rebounds. Doesn't make a difference. He and and my point is their guards and their wings needed to shoot more threes and make more threes, and they needed to have the ability to do something other than cram it down his throat, which is what they tried to do. That I can agree with you on. He looked nervous. He again missed baby hooks all night long, missed dunks all night long, shot air balls from the free throw line. He, he could have played better. That's that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I just think that it is. Yeah. I don't do the whole, well, he did what he's done the last four years. Okay, cool. I, I wasn't aware that the regular season stuff he did is it should be the same as a national championship game. My point is my I'm watching this game and I'm looking for the little things. I agree with your point on the air balls and looking nervous, 100%, but I'm looking for the little things in terms of offensive execution. When they throw it to Edie, they were clearly trying to run a set last night where they throw it to Edie off the left wing and he kicks it to the right wing, to which he was unable to do. You have to know when you get the ball, they're going to double you. You got to move it. And I think the, 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 like in the second half, the, the, that, he had a seven, eight minute stretch there where, what was it, two or three traveling calls? They stripped him in the in the paint. Yeah, it, he shot the air ball from the free throw line, right? But I, I just it, they just weren't ready. They weren't ready. I agree. Stepanek, Purdue wasn't ready mentally. I don't I think agree. it was. A, I don't think it was a talent issue at all. Big Daddy Magic, hey player, Kentucky needs Greg Foster. No, nobody needs. John Dry, hey y'all, guns up, horns down, pew pew. Okay, okay. Uh, Lil Jizzy, hello. RJC Loner always has the worst takes. Yeah, he, he doesn't. It's kind of a brand at this point. He doesn't know a lot about sports. Speaking of which, um, I love Monty. Worst take. Okay, first of all, there's no need to lie in your comment, dude. That's bullshit. Uh, I have never seen anyone hit side of the backboard from the free throw line. Have you? Who said they hit the side Nobody of the backboard? Nobody said. God. Oh my God. You're Nobody getting into this that. territory where I'm just not going to read your comments anymore. That's not what he said. He said they airballed free throws. Zach Eady shot an airball from the free throw line. Their guards, and I think it happened two or three times, at least twice, I can remember, drive down the baseline, go to shoot a layup, like go to shoot a little teardrop, whatever you want to call it, and hit the side of the backboard. And then. There, the the guard does a really good job on pick and roll with Zach Eady because it was I thought it was the one set for the guards that worked well when Zach Eady would mid post come up set the screen especially set the screen going to the guard left. You're getting to the rim and you lay it up off the board and it misses the rim altogether. Nobody, you don't hit the side of the backboard from the free throw line. Uh, I I'm telling you now. I'm telling you now, if you want to make ridiculous comments, I'm just not going to read it. OG Gary, Kentucky coach, give me Iguodala. (laughs) Can you imagine Andre Iguodala? I think he's going to be a a good head coach, but yeah, Max Kellerman. I love Max Kellerman. Uh, Eric and Raleigh, Dave Fleming on play-by-play and Jay Billis on color. Your your Bay Area bias is showing, although um, Dave Fleming, who's one of the uh, broadcasters for the San Francisco Giants and now does. I think, you know what Dave Fleming's really good on? Golf. Dave Fleming as a golf announcer is really, really good. Uh, Dakota Tubbs, Jake is full red ass today. 
matching his hoodie. Yeah, I just think that, look, I, I think that what we like to do as sports fans is we like to say, oh, man, Edie's amazing, great season. You know, he, yes. he was the reason they were winning all season. And then today, on days like today, what we don't want to say is, yeah, dude played tight in the second half. He he was not able to get the vibe right for his teammates in the offense. And 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 so I'm just saying, if you're gonna be the face of your team when it's good, you also got to wear it when it's bad. I'm I agree. Thirty seven and ten, great job. You should roll out of bed and do that against most teams with your size and your skill set, especially like, when the plan was clearly to foul him. Yeah. When you, I think it was sixteen fouls that were used against him. I mean, the plan was clearly to foul. You fouled one guy out. You had four on Klingon. And the guards were routinely raking his arms when the ball would go into the post. The plan was to make him do it. And he did a decent job from the free throw line. After he shot the air ball, it clearly turned him up. Right. He clearly woke up. It was one of those moments where, like, you shoot an air ball and you're like, okay, enough of this bullshit, right? Like, yeah. you're just, you ha you've had enough. And by the way, I agree with the plan from UConn. Yeah. Like, take everybody away so do I. and let, let Edie do what he's going to do. So and it worked. It was masterful. It was perfect. And and that's why I say that's that next level of basketball that, that Zach Edie has to develop. You have to be able to understand, okay, hey, here's clear. We're seven, eight minutes into this game. This is what they're doing. How are we going to combat that? Is he an NBA player? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's got the skill set to play in the NBA. My question is, does he have the the – want to the killer instinct in him to go out and battle. Games. Oh, I think he does. The the bigger the bigger question will be does he develop anything other than a than a paint a paint, a paint game? Can he hit a can he hit a jump shot? Cuz yeah. in today's NBA, Gotta have and it. the paycheck is good as a as a bench warmer. Azabuki for the Jazz collected many good paychecks. But you are going to have to show you can do something other than nothing. Well, I think the question is, is he Robin Lopez or is he, you well, know, can he be more? Can he ever become Brooke Lopez or is he always going to be Robin? Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't think anyone's ever going to accuse this guy of being Jokic, you know, I, but I think that this guy can be, is he better than Vucevic in Chicago? You know, can he be? He'll never be that shooter. He, see, and the funny thing is, if you gave him Vucevic's jumper with, Edie's low post game, he'd be the best player in the NBA. Yeah. We would call him Joel Embiid light. Right. But he'll never have that jumper. Yeah. Never. Uh, then give the same lecture to his teammates, which I think which to your point, I, I you have. I am. I, I have. think, look, dude, like I, I think that, that they were, they were, they were outclassed last night. I texted him last night and I said, I do believe UConn is just an outright better team. And we disagree on that, but I do think UConn's a better team. Your guards are better. Your big understands how to operate better, understands when to be when to be high, when to be low, where he should be, like to allow your offense to flow. Like that they just are better. They execute better. And and whether you want to attribute that to talent or Dan Hurley or whatever the case may be, they're a better team, man. And like, Purdue choked. Yeah. And Purdue choked. <laughs> like, so I don't know why. And Purdue choked. Boss, like, with all due respect, dude, I love you, but I don't know why you want to die in this hill. They didn't get it done last night, and Edie was part of that. I think, well, that's the right way to say it. But you, you came in kind of stroking the big fella, saying that it was his fault and he sucks. And yeah, I was he's a terrible off watching player. him last night. He turned it over five, six times out of 10, 12 straight possessions that they got, and it absolutely ended the game. Yeah, they came out in the second half, and the game was over. Yeah. They never, Purdue yeah. never came out. At all. Uh, the Big Ten needs UConn, Lamont Tucker. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. The Big Ten's got to improve their basketball brand. Everybody Th there's no needs doubt. UConn. Yeah. Caleb Aylmore, what's up? Uh, UConn let Edie eat while suffocating the other Purdue doo-doos. Yeah. Purdue doos. I would not disagree with that. Uh, Lopes fan Gabe, hello. Hit the like button, casuals. Yes, we appreciate that. Uh, Christopher Shannon, toxicity levels are rising. Easy. Fleming is working the Masters for ESPN this week. He's great on golf. He is great on golf. So excited for the Masters. Dave, Dave is, uh, I like Dave a lot. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. Uh, Robert Fowler, the lonely ACC homer Monty troll is out in full force this morning. Oh, do we have an ACC troll? Let's not. Let's not. Please, different show. UW fan Jim, I uh, might be the only one here that cares, but Bill Belichick, you are the only one. 
Yeah. Oh my God. Did you see him in a UW hoodie? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Is that going to make, uh, you know, good old Rome run a little faster for you? Who cares? Come on. Who it, like it is quite literally meaningless. It means nothing. He is how many he's been in several spring ball camps in college. Why wouldn't you? If you're, I mean, he loves the game, you know, um, you know, RJC man, totally misreading me, Monty. Hit the reset button, sir. No, I'm not going to hit. You're a pain in the ass most days. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't mind. Like, <laughs> you want to argue about stuff that just isn't factual. Nobody here ever said that they hit the side of the backboard from the free throw line. And you want to, that's just not, you don't have to choose violence. You don't have to go the the route of the, the Sammy Michigan fan guy. Yeah, Dutch right? season. Uh, again, sometimes a team is just better than the other team. UConn is just better, a better team. I, I, I'm happy to say that UConn is U, UConn. I think UConn's a dynasty now. Yeah. Again, no way around it. How many universities can change head coaches and have multiple dynasties? I mean, it is. It's why it, go back and look at the alumni list from UConn basketball. And again, women and men's right with yeah. UConn. Uh, that does not mean you got to bring down a player on the losing team. And, and to what I would say is, Zach Eady was not good enough last night. It, it's, it like, I would agree with that sentiment. Like the people saying Caitlin Clark's not the best player ever because she didn't win a national championship. I think that's just being an idiot. And it lacks perspective on what she did for the game, man. I think Zach Eady is in the same boat as far as the singular championship game critique. Zach Eady and Caitlin Clark, both of them had to be better in the second half of their games, and they were not. Mm -hmm. And they're the reasons their teams win and lose routinely. So they're the reasons their team lost in the championship game. Caitlin Clark was not very... That might be, and I haven't seen much of her games, that's got to be the worst second half I've ever seen her play. Just getting her pocket picked multiple times at the top of the key. Haven't seen that before, right? South Carolina was just more ready to deal with her. Yeah. Zach Eady, UConn was more ready to deal with him. And neither one of them was good enough in the championship game, especially in the second half when the games are won and lost. Uh, exactly, Team Money, J2H came in hot on Eady. Frankly, I can't, I can care less than you should care less. My NBA season ended again the Mad Sunday. <laughs> and the NCAA season three weeks ago against Utah State. Ooh, that's got to hurt. Yeah. My basketball season ended against Utah State. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's a darker time than the solar eclipse yesterday. You got to play dude. the funeral music. When oh. you say any time that you have a My basketball season ended. <laughs> Against the Utah State, Those God damn Aggie it! Tears Aggie tears are flowing. Oh God! <laughs> Back to work. Have a good day, Jen. See, see you in two weeks, bud. You too, boss. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Giggity Edie uh, started talking a big game the last couple of weeks and melted in the biggest game of his yes, career. Yes, yes. The second half last night. That's not tape. He's going to want to go back and watch. He will. It's not tape you want to go back and watch. Uh, Oki State, Stoolwater James. <laughs> I don't know. If I'm an NBA GM, I want Zach Eady on my team. He's physically ready for the NBA, much more than Victor. <laughs> <laughs> you knew this was an inevitability. <laughs> Uh, hey, I'm a, I'm a head out. Hey, uh, hey, bud. Our, look, RJC loner phone, big 12. Ye James. of sliced open steer. I don't know how to break it to you, but Victor Wambanyama. I don't, I, I am happy to say that physically it doesn't matter. And I was wrong about him physically because, uh, Victor Wambanyama is, playing incredible basketball the the his skill set now he's going to have to figure it out physically i still say that I, I do think the only question around victor's <laughs> game right now is longevity that's it i mean can he can he stay healthy he you don't 
So one thing I hadn't considered is that because he's a, a slider player, yes. right? He's skinny. He's not some big, you know, hulking presence. You don't see him banging on the block with dudes a lot. And because of that, that may allow him to stay healthier. That may allow him yes. to, you know, to play more games. I'm still concerned that dude's going to blow his knee out one night because he runs so damn much in transition. But if that happens, it happens. I mean, I, I, I think if you're you deal the Spurs, with it. if you're VW, like you, you can't really have asked for better out of him in his rookie season so far. I think Victor Wamanyama is set up to be a perennial MVP candidate in this league. If he stays healthy and he mixes in some some fettuccine and weight room. Yeah, I do think he's got to get stronger. Yeah. But you're never going to see him bulk. I think what you're going to see is he's just in totality in his body going to add strength. And when he does that, you know, I think, you know, he'll he'll continue to get better. And, and again, can you imagine that cat's shoe size? Yeah, what is he, size like 87? Thin as a rail, too. I mean, you've got to have Velcro on that thing, right? Can you anyway, measure it? <laughs> the cock. Uh, big blue horses. As, a bas as basketball fades into the background, our attention turns to a tradition unlike any other. The, the NFL draft. <clears throat> oh. Oh, yeah, the, the Masters. Yes, right. Mike Smith. I'm just looking forward to the NFL draft. Yeah. I want I want the about, Bears dude. to get on with absolutely <laughs> dude, destroying another quarterback. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We just skipped right over baseball. No, don't like, okay, all right. Basketball ended. The, the season ended last night. All right, we're going right to the what? No baseball? No, the season ended last night in San Diego. Come on. Did you see the Cubs game last night? You didn't. No, I was too busy coming up with irrational takes about the Canadian. Okay. The, the Cubs last night, you guys, were up eight to nothing <laughs> and lost. And I should go back and check. I turned it off. <laughs> like I was in a I my wife came home last night. Like I was happy to have her. Like I was excited. The Cubs were up eight, eight nothing. You Darvish got his ass whooped. <laughs> I was like, okay, you know, I need 10 strikeouts uh, between good old you, Darvish, and my guy, Javier Assad. Like, I need 10 combined strikeouts. Javier you, Darvish, Assad. you, Darvish, gets that butthole run to the locker room with three strikeouts. Or, excuse me, four they're strikeouts. The broadcast I was like, like, okay. They're like, hey, he's throwing 35 pitches this inning. Are they going to take him out? Four strikeouts. I, I Am I going to get... Six strikeouts from from Javi, good old Javi Assad. Yeah, I did. I got seven. I cashed on prize picks. Fucking right. <laughs> We're up eight nothing. <laughs> and then they put up seven in the sixth inning. I thought you said seven in one inning. It's like, all right, it's fine. And I even said in the Monty Show members only exclusive top secret information shared group chat on Loner Instagram. Fun that I don't know if the Cubs can pitch like this the entire season, but yeah, it feels good. They promptly gave up seven runs in the, in the sixth inning. <laughs> and then Mr. Fucking steroid guy, uh, Javier, uh, Javier, I ride my motorcycle on steroids. Baez. <laughs> uh, I, 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 Assad melts down. Okay, fine. Yeah. Javier out of the game. Yeah. We got a one run lead. It's fine. It wasn't fine. It was it was not fine. Um, that's because after you took Assad out, and I don't know why, and I could be wrong, but Jose Cuas should not be in the major leagues anymore. <laughs> like Cuas out the fucking door. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> He comes in and gives you a quality outing. Yeah. One third of an inning. That means he got one dude out. Uh, three hits, four earn, uh, four runs, two earned. <laughs> and you know, you know that you're up to your neck in cow shit. <coughs> when <coughs> Adbert uh, Alzale, your, your closer. Yeah, your boy. Last night. Uh, two thirds of an inning, a hit, an earned run, a home run, and a blown save. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming.
Next time, don't wear a mask and a gun when on payday. <laughs> okay, thank you. Dude, he Fucking had a good Chris. spring. Give him Screw some him. slack. So, yeah, the baseball season ended last night. No, it did not. Fucking assholes. Come on. Whatever. Uh, OG Gary, get him, Travis. Okay. Robert Fowler. Uh, hey, Victor, the play of James came after your boy. Do you have a response? Uh, I, You know, okay. Okay. Um, let's, what are you, what is going, uh, no baseball for me, sir. Mike Smith is out. Uh, Dakota, Zach Eady is going to sell a lot of corn dogs in the association. Isn't that right, James? <laughs> James says Zach ate all the corn dogs past tense. Okay. Okay. Uh, J2H, baseball only starts to matter in August, September. Sorry, that's NFL and college football territory. So in reality, MLB never matters. I disagree with that. But if it helps y'all feel better, go Astros. Exactly. Dude. Why are you being a red ass about exactly. it? First team, all chest buzzer. Caleb, I'm curious if Brett Yormark revisits UConn to the Big 12. It probably won't happen still because of how atrocious the football team is. Yeah, nobody wants to. Yeah. Nobody wants to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my heart was broken last night in football and or in baseball. Like the, it, It's tough for me that we're one week into the season and it's over. Well, I mean, I, I will say this. I do think that uh, if you have the MLB app on your TV, that's a pretty nice experience right now. I've enjoyed using that better than better than extra innings on direct TV. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> it was rough. Uh, download the prize picks app. Use the promo code Monty. M-O-N-T-Y Monty on the prize picks app. And um, they'll match your deposit 100%. So here was my win on prize picks last night. And it and it was a dandy. Um, that at least went well. Because... Are you on a hot streak again? Or what's it looking like? Shut up, Jake. Um, uh, last night on prize picks, Zach Eady, I needed 38 and a half points, rebounds, and assists. Now, if you listen to Jake, Jake Zach Eady's terrible. Um, he's Garbo. For he's sure. Garbo. Uh, 47. <laughs> it's garbage. I needed 38 and a half points, rebounds, and assists. Uh, the big fella got me 47. Yeah. Juan Soto. Chankies. Um, needed one and a half hits, runs, and RBIs. I got six. Javier Asad and you, Darvish. I needed nine and a half combined strikeouts. I got 11. I got 11. Uh, ended a bit of a drought. Uh, I lost two in a row thanks to Miles Michaelis. You prick. Uh, Ronald Acuna Jr. Hope you trip and fall. Um, and then there's uh, Seth Lugo, who I hope you cut your lip shaving today, Seth. Damn. Uh, Kyrie Irving, screw you. America's favorite anti-Semite. Marka. Marka. Anybody else notice there was no NBA last night? And I missed it. I wanted to see Devin Booker miss all those three-pointers. He didn't play last night. Yeah, have you picked up on the fact that people are starting to call Luka and Kyrie the best duo in the NBA? Shut up. That they are somehow now, you know, the uh, a force to be reckoned with. And, you know, it's the Mavericks versus <laughs> the world. And, like, dude, I, 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 the guy hasn't even, like, like Luka Doncic hasn't even done anything in the playoffs yet. And yet we're sitting here Man. crowning dude because they've had a nice little run here. Look, Luka's hot mom and America's favorite anti-Semite are a formidable duo. I totally agree with that. That's a battle that I agree you are, you're going to have to fight. But I am telling you now that I am not, uh, I'm not, I'm not that guy. Yeah. I am not that guy. I am not. I am not a a Mavs fan, in any way, shape, or form. And, and, and they're just obnoxious. Like, look, I understand Kyrie went there after he made all those dumb remarks, and you know the Mavs play was like an escape hatch for him. And you know, I, like I get it. I understand that's why you went to Dallas. But let's not sit here and say you guys are like an NBA championship power or something. You haven't proven that. No. Uh, hour number two of the Monty Show presented by Big O Tires and American Fork. Your total car care experts. Big O Tires and American Fork. Um, go see Ryan. Find him on uh, social. Find a guy, Ryan, at uh, Big O Tires and American Fork. 
Big O Tires AF on, and AF is American Fork. Right. I don't know what else it would be. Me either. Uh, Big O Tires AF on uh, Instagram. Make sure you tell them you heard about him on the Monty Show. Uh, is Ryan joining us? It's Tuesday. Yes. He's usually here at yes, 7 o'clock. He, he, he said he will be here in one minute. He's big timing us. Yes, he's big timing us. You know, um, which is fine. Now, is Ryan's fine. somebody who allegedly, and I haven't seen the pictures, but said that he had basically like a perfect bracket working, like an 80% correct bracket. Oh, did he? Re- oh, apparently. Do, and, do and, we and, need to talk about that? Yeah, and I think that I want to say he had UConn, Dude. but I don't. Uh, I uh, I am not here for the bracket. I Didn't I, didn't I finish? My bracket was such a wreck, you guys. Oh my God. Uh, I don't even want to, uh, I don't want to know what my bracket turned into. Um, I don't even know how to find it anymore on the ESP, <laughs> which is good. Yeah, it's lost in the abyss of the website. Dude. I, I am not, uh, I am not here for bracketology. Uh, I am pretty certain that I finished in the, um, Six million sixty seven thousand seven hundred and sixty one. <laughs> My bracket finished. I kid you not on ESPN's bracket challenge. God, I'm terrible at this. Six million sixty seven thousand seven hundred and sixty one. I got seventy seven percent of the picks correct. I picked Yukon as the champion. Thankfully, I, I I am not. Listen, I'm not going to sit here and espouse to you that uh, I some. I, but I had UConn in Purdue. Yeah, yeah. And I picked UConn. Wow, I got the I got the score uh, almost exactly right. What was the uh, What was the final score of that game last night? Something like a. It was. Wow, I got really close. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's not lose our. Let's not lose our mark. 75, 75 to 60. And what did you have? I had it 70 to 67. Damn. I got, well, so the spread, I might have missed the, eh. the spread a, a little bit. There's Ryan. So good wait, morning. we go tires in American fork. Did you had a really good bracket working? Yeah, I was uh, just under, I was 500,000. Wow. Were you, I'm, I was 6 million. Yeah, well, which really, Monty, it's not that bad because it was out of like 22 million. Oh, really? Yeah. Top 50% over here. You know. Yeah. (laughs) I got Purdue and UConn right. Yeah. And I was was 98.7% tile. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. What did you, did you have, you must have Purdue and Connecticut then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have... I had 14 of the 16 Sweet 16 teams, and then I had eight or four of the eight, and then from there, obviously, I just, yeah. So to BYU let you down in your bracket then? Stop. Well, and one of my brackets, so I, I do one, like, smart bracket that I know is a good decision. I do one just BYU. Like, I had a BYU <laughs> going to the uh, Elite Eight um, in one of my brackets. But the other one I had lose the second round. Yeah, that that elite eight pick out of BYU. That was that bracket where you're like, "Hey, man, you know what? It, the 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 final four is on conference weekend. We're gonna get really, we're gonna vibe with that and take BYU to the elite eight. No. Yeah, I uh, yeah, and I had a high Iowa State like playing them in like this in the elite eight. I think it was. Yeah, I went pretty risky on that one. Yeah, I I also had one that was like I lost every game I picked. I don't believe I got a single pick right in the crazy bracket, which is awesome. Uh, Big O Tires American Fork uh, presents Jake Retzloff on the Monty Show every Thursday at seven thirty. Is Jake Retzloff the starting quarterback at BYU? Yes, I think he is. I think he is. I I have almost no. Let me ask uh, no you without this. a doubt. Look, BYU guy. Let me ask you this. <laughs> Because we had this debate on the show last week. Do BYU football fans have an unhealthy love affair with the backup quarterback? For years. 
Hmm. I mean, yeah, I could best. I could see that. I could see, and I think people aren't giving Jake a fair shot. Last year, they are scrutinizing him for the way he played, and I, I, I just think everyone's already uh, not everyone. A lot of individuals have already written off Jake. But Which yeah, is wild. Backup quarterbacks in our past, we've had lots of good backups that have come in, and yeah, people always want the guy behind them. Right, I, I, and I've heard the argument that some people want Ryder. I've heard a lot of people that reach out to me that Ryder, he can throw dimes and he can slice and dice. Yeah, so. look how long everybody wanted Tanner Mangum. Oh, you remember geez. that, like the. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, the Nebraska throw, and it's what it's what football fans do. Jake Retzloff yeah. should be if 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 Jake Retzloff truly, if we wind up week one with Jake Retzloff as a starting quarterback, I think that that every BYU fan should be on thy knee, thanking your God because I think this guy is going. I think Jake Retzloff is going to be awesome. I think he is every level. Ryan high school when he got the job. Juco, when he got the job, he has exploded and taken a huge step forward. And I think he is the exact right guy for that job. Absolutely. So, anyway, what's going on in Tireland? How's everything at Big O Tires? How's business been? What's great? Spring break's over down in this area for the most part. So now we're getting people that are back coming home from the trips. Had some engine lights come on. Cars making some noise on the way home from St. George. So they're dropping off their cars. We're getting them taken care of um yeah it's been it's good we're ready for we're, we're, i'm ready for summer yeah aren't we all um yeah. how how often is a check engine light like terminal like what is your garden variety co- what code usually gets spit out by that check engine light when the check engine light is flashing that's when you need to like oh geez let's get it to the shop um i think the most common check engine light is probably like the an oxygen sensor or like a gas cap or catalytic converter which basically just means the gas cap's not on all the way or you got a bad cat which probably means you put really cheap gas in your car and it's a little older um you're shaking your head where do you get your gas bro i i had i the, the only check engine light i've had in recent life is a stupid uh, fuel exhaust sensor that would like could not figure it out. Mm-hmm. Like, to, and I went right to the gas cap. The problem is the the car that I had at the time didn't have a gas cap. It mm-hmm. had one of those doors that that. Yeah, that's everything's going to that now. Yeah, and so it was in the fu- the exhaust the like the fuel fume fume exhaust. I don't know a thing about cars. Like, don't give me a wrench. I don't know what. Yeah, to do I can with tell. It. But. <laughs> Like the fuel line, the fuel exhaust lines were cracked. So like, eBay, buy a new car, yeah, or just bring it to me. (laughs) Bigger tires in America, exactly. Or just go see. So what is it? What is it? You you hook up the little box that reads the code. Oh, look at the new sign! Boom! Wow! Back in Monty's stomping days. That look looks look at that, man. So is the rebuild are, is your construction, is your renovation done? Uh we've got one more wall they gotta put a wrap on. But yeah, for the most part, she's ready. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. I need to come and see you soon. I got it. Yeah, I need to. And you got the BYU flag in the window. I like it. Amen. Where's the popcorn machine? She's right here. All right. Let's go. There it is. See how organized it is, too. It, it, it's it's asking you to come get some popcorn. Water. Got a fridge. Dude. You got a bad fridge. Hot chocolate, coffee. Let's go. Man. Social media discounts, you know. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. I like it. All right, good. Rock chips. You got a rock chip? We got you. So you we do. Win- we won't oh talk my about God, that, dude. Monty. We won't talk about windshields. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring up that. Bro. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Dude, you joke. I told you about this last week. The stupid BMW. I... Hey, it's not the BMW's fault that you were driving and you got a rock chip in your window. Do we? Will construction in this state ever end? No, because no. people won't stop moving here because you're promoting everyone to how amazing it is. And, <laughs> and it is. Utah's amazing. Uh, Ryan, always good to see you, my guy. I, uh, I, I need to come by and see you soon. 
I need to come by and see you soon. The shop looks great. I'm really, uh, I am, I'm really appreciative of your support of this show and Jake Retzloff. Always good to see you, man. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Have a good one guys. Take care. There you go. That's our guy. Uh, Ryan at Big O Tires and American Fork. Dude, Boy, the store looks the store really good. Gas, dude. So it used to be that you walk in his store and the desk would kind of be off to your right, sort yeah. of like deeper in the store. Yep. Now the desks are right off the left when you walk in. You got a nice waiting area, popcorn, hot chocolate, bed fridge. He's got the hookup, dude. And I'll go back to I miss the smell of rubber in the morning because I do like walking into a tire store. It's one of the things I enjoy about. Yeah. I, you walk in there and you can smell the, yeah. the tires. It It is good. All right. Without further ado on the Monty Show, what is going on with the College Football Super League? And let's get into it because there was a lot of controversy over the weekend. Ross Dellinger and others uh, pronounced the College Football Super League dead, uh, saying that administrators had told them it will never happen. I can tell you that's the exact opposite of what we're hearing. And I think one of the big question marks is what is the impact that the new college football playoff TV deal has had uh, on the Super League? I, I I think it's more than that because that's the big question. That's what everybody's talking about. Hey, you have this extension of the college football playoff for ESPN. Does that mean that the Super League is dead? I am telling you from multiple sources, the answer is no. It has always been an uphill climb, right? I think we always know, have known that building the God tier the Super League, whatever you want to say, I think it's always been an uphill climb. But here's the truth. Whatever makes the the top teams in college athletics more money is eventually going to happen. I think we know that. I do believe that the College Football Super League, call it what you want, um, it's going to happen. It is not a matter of if, but when. Here are the biggest challenges. I don't think there's any doubt getting all of the power players in college athletics from TV to presidents, chancellors, athletic directors, and certainly football coaches in the same room to agree to do the same thing has always been, will always be the singular biggest challenge in making a college football Super League come to fruition. There's just no doubt about the fact that it's very difficult to get hundreds of men in a room and have them agree and have all of them say, yeah, you know what? I don't need to be the biggest voice in the room. I think that is always going to be the biggest challenge here. But I also think if it is better for their pocketbooks and if it is better for their legacies, it's going to happen. And there is no question that a Super League is better for their pocketbooks and better for their legacies, and it's going to happen. Now, I have talked to a lot of people in TV And I think the thing that we have been told repeatedly by multiple sources is without a doubt that the major players in college TV, which would be ESPN, which would be CBS, which would be Fox, are all on board with making the College Football Super League happen. There is in no way, shape, or form a roadblock or a barrier put in place by the extension of the college football playoff. Just about everybody we talk to in TV has agreed with that sentiment. But the biggest question is, what's the timeline for the college football Super League? I think there is an unknown timeline. Private money is ready to move on this today. That is not what's going to move the needle. What's going to move the needle is everybody getting together and deciding who is actually going to have creative control over whatever you want to call this, the college football Super League. Because right now, the folks that have the private money also want to have the creative control. I think that is the single biggest barrier right now to making a college football Super League happen in the next five years, which is why I think we've pretty regularly said, and if you go back on the channel and you watch our videos, I think the next two years is going to be one of the most important periods in time in the history of college football. And I say that because you have all of this instability in the ACC. I think that situation comes to a head. I believe, and I have continued to hear, that the ACC and Florida State are negotiating uh, a a graceful end to their, their their blood feud that is going on. I believe that we are going to get some finality in the ACC within the next six to 10 months, would be my guess. 
I don't think that has any impact on the college football Super League. I truly believe over the next two years, you, you, you are going to make or break the current incarnation, which would be 70 to 84 teams competing in a higher tier with the ability of the G5 to have access to that higher tier based on their ability to provide scholarships, NIL, and essentially facilitate a higher quality of existence for their athletes in football. That's what the criteria is going to be if you're in the G5 to get into the Super League. I think most people agree to that. The biggest question is, will private money be willing to put in their private money without having much of a say? And Jake, I think that is the single biggest barrier to making a college football Super League happen. Absolutely. And I think money money has always been the 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 defining factor in college athletics. You know, you you look around college athletics and you can see a variety of different situations being impacted by money. You know, it's the it's the famous Arizona example. Um, you know, you you look at it at the conference level and we're constantly talking about TV deal numbers and and so when it comes to this Super League concept, which I think would be very healthy for college football, uh, it comes down to money. And and again, when you talk about getting a bunch of men in a room, what are they concerned about? Well, how much is this going to pay me? How much access am I going to have? What's my what's my uh, ability to earn more if I win? You know, what what does all that look like? So I just think that that money has always been a defining factor in college athletics. And I think that, you know, people people don't put enough weight on it. It's easy as a national reporter to come out here and be like, oh, yeah, you know, the Super League is dead and nobody's interested and and and, you know, it's 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 dead on arrival. And the reality of the situation is nothing is alive or dead on arrival. It's an ongoing conversation. And that conversation revolves around money. And yes, there is private companies and private money ready to go on this as they're ready to go on anything that's going to make them money. And that's the advantage football has. Football has proven success at making people more money. So now the only question is going to be, how long are we going to wait to do this? Because I believe it's an inevitability. I believe that that this is going to happen because it has to happen. The college football playoff system we know today does not work for everybody. It does not allow enough access. It is a subjective process. They'll tell you, hey, you know, it's it there's a like there's a a, a formula that we have to follow as a committee. You know, we're weighing this and weighing that and we're making decisions here and there. But the reality of the situation is to get the biggest audiences, to get the most interest, you need every game and every situation to be decided on the field. And as part of that process, your ad partners can benefit. That's why this is an inevitability. And that's why eventually the college football playoff system we know today is going to die. And, and that's why I say you, we can believe Ross if we want and, and, and try to get on board with, hey, this is dead. The reality is, is it's never going to be dead. Because the idea of people making money yeah. is alive and well every single day. When you have this many dudes trying to hammer something out, I think you're going to have a very difficult path. It is going to be time consuming. It is going to be expensive. It is going to be frustrating. I think you are going to have administrators that are like, I'm not, I don't want to be involved in this anymore. Like you're going to have highs and you are going to have lows and it is going to take time. I think the next two years, is absolutely make or break if we are going to get a, a a Super League in the modern era. And I believe that we will. There's too many reasons to do it. There is not enough reasons not to do it. Yeah, what's more expensive, doing it or not doing it? Because I can make a pretty compelling case that not doing this is more expensive. Not doing this limits people's access to making money. And again, I I, I go back to these lawsuits, and I think probably the most damaging one I mean, they're all damaged. There's a lot of lawsuits out there with NIL and back pay for NIL that are going to cripple the NCAA's ability to operate. It is going to be billions of dollars. And I think that that is going to be the the real lever that you're going to pull uh, to move guys off their spot for this, for this college football Super League because any more... The NCAA just, I think, recognizes that they can't win these fights. It's you're you're gonna get new transfer regulations this week, supposedly, uh, where they're going to allow you to transfer multiple times based on your academic standing. 
um, and you're not going to have to sit out. Well, why is that? Because we had a court decision that said you cannot prevent people from transferring and playing immediately. So now they're going to try and find ways to make that the the way of the land. Yeah, you're the problem is that you are going to have real issues paying the bill that is coming due. And I I think I think one of the things that we've never in this country been able to get away from is when the court says you owe the money, you owe the money. You're not getting away from the billions of dollars. And by some accounts, it could be a hundred billion dollar tab coming due when this legislation is done. If that is in fact the case, and if that is in fact what happens, college football, as you know, it is going to come to an end very quickly. Yeah. So you do you really just think they're going to stop playing college football? That's not going to happen. That is not going to happen. Why do you think Brett Yormark and other commissioners have been so aggressive in dividing their, their basketball and their football operations? Because you're trying to insulate. The problem is NIL is about college basketball and football. It's about all sports. That's why you're going to lose. I think it's hundreds of billions. I think it is a lot of money that is going to go out the door to pay settlements because you're going to wind up paying athletes who were denied the right to make money on their name, image, and likeness. You're going to wind up paying them in arrears. Yes. You, you're going to owe a lot of former college athletes a lot of money. And I don't know how you pay that besides making more money. And that's exactly what a super league's about. hundred percent. So I think it is not a matter of if I think it is a matter of when and really more how. And, and I think this is one of the few concepts in, college sports where you know again not to discredit ross or anybody like ross not but, at all but, but i think that guys like ross who have you know the editorial standard they have and you know the reputation they need to keep they can't be seen to be saying you know or having the conversation that we're able to have and i think that's why you see them out on twitter saying like oh well it's dead and it takes these parties and yada yada, yada. okay cool right that's fine but but what we're not saying is that is that while it may be dead today, the conversation's ongoing. The conversation is evolving and growing. And I'm telling you, there are too many people who want this to happen for it not to happen. I think there's too many administrators and power players in college athletics that are scared of these lawsuits for this not to happen. There is a there is a real fear. I was talking to a cat yesterday about the fear fear. And that's the word he used, the fear around the outcome of these NIL lawsuits. And the 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 idea that the the debt that you will owe out of those lawsuits continues to grow. Because time is not on your side if you're the NCAA with these lawsuits. Time is not on your side because it's just getting more and more expensive. Money's getting more and more expensive. Yeah. And I think the longer you make for instance, private money coming into the, the college football Super League. Do you think that money's going to get cheaper as time goes on? If you just have these dudes sit by the wayside and tell them they don't matter and tell them you don't want their money, do you think their money gets more expensive or do you think they come to you with cheaper money? It's going to get more expensive because where's your leverage going? Your leverage isn't going up. Every time there's a lawsuit you lose, your leverage goes down because you need the money more and more. Yes. So I think it is simply a matter of when. And how? And what's going to be the tipping point? Because I think what's going to happen is some of these lawsuits in the next 12 to 18 months are going to come through and you're going to have, you're just going to keep pushing more and more weight to the to one end of the scale. And I think eventually the tipping point happens. Yes. And this will, I because I do think that ESPN, ESPN really has a, a larger, a disproportionate amount of say in in changing these contracts, not only because they have the ACC, the SEC, and the Big 12, but also because they have the college football playoff. Yeah. And if if you are going to do a, a Super League, you are going to have to renegotiate that college football playoff contract you just put pen to paper on, and you're going to have to renegotiate or invalidate your grant of rights. And if that's going to happen, somebody's going to have to make ESPN and ABC whole. And my guess is you do that through the Super League. Hundred percent. You do that by do you renegotiating their deal. Dude, do you see how much flexibility there is in this concept? Like how many ways there are to do business. That's the other thing with the college football playoff model. It's very rigid. There's not a lot of ways yes. to kind of you know meander your money through it. And I think that that your average Joe 
football fan who doesn't watch every single game and doesn't like follow this stuff super closely doesn't understand that concept as well. They don't understand that, hey, the college football playoff, while it is expanded now, is still incredibly limiting. I mean, you're you're talking about 12 teams. Yep, like, totally agree. Uh, make sure you download the Prize Picks app, prizepicks.com, or find it in your app store. Use the promo code Monty to open up your new account, make your first deposit, and Prize Picks will match your deposit up to 100% when you use the promo code Monty, M O N T Y. Monty is your promo code to get 100% deposit matching up to $100. That means you put in 10, they're going to give you 10. And trust me when I tell you, you can play prize picks for months on $20. As somebody who was down to my last nickel in prize picks just a few short, long weeks ago, then it feels like forever ago now. And as somebody who gets hot and then gets cold and usually has to find a couple of nickels to rub together on prize picks... You're better at prize picks than I am. Trust me when I say that. And I hope you are because it is a good, good revenue stream. Hook it up, prizepicks.com. Download the app. Make sure you use the promo code Monty, M-O-N-T-Y. Monty is your prize picks promo code. Chris E, hello. Super League won't work if they only have the Big Ten in the SEC, correct? Yeah. There is this idea that the Big Ten in the SEC are just going to walk away. They clearly don't have the ability to do that. When you sign the college football playoff, I think a lot of people don't understand the significant change that a new extension with ESPN and ABC brought to the college football playoff. It ended the ability of anybody to unilaterally act. There's no ability anymore. If you want to win the championship of college football, you have to go through the college football playoff. Yeah. So this idea that, oh, the Big Ten and the SEC are just going to walk away, going to form their own thing, that's done. That's done. They need everybody to form everybody's thing anymore. That threat is gone now, right? I think you you have to understand now that when you sign that extension with ESPN and ABC, you handed the TV industry control of college football. Yep. You handed it to them. This goes back to, you know, tier three rights going away in these new grant of rights where you no longer had BYU TV broadcasting that one crappy game that you had. That doesn't happen anymore. Those things are gone. I think, I don't know that you will ever see the Longhorn Network again. I don't know that you will, that you'll ever see an individual university have their own thing. I think it's much more like what Deion Sanders at Colorado does, Coach Prime on, on Amazon Prime, yeah, where he has his own reality series. That's what Tier 3 rights look like now, where you have video series inside spring camp, inside fall ball, right? Like where you have, you know, that hard knock style production following around Alabama football, following around Ohio, the, the Ohio State. Right. Right. That's what you're going to see now. Because you have to commit. You have no choice but to find alternative alternative revenue streams. And anymore, you look at a lot of universities using YouTube as a revenue stream now. As they should be. Because you have to. It's it's the way things have to go. Dallin Sproul, hello. Dallin, good to see you. Uh, it's never going to happen due to TV deals and money. What do we expect? The TV companies to pay more? Probably not dead, but I don't see it happening. Unfortunately, relegation would be so cool. I think that the TV industry, it obviously is going to be the ones to decide what they're willing and unwilling to do. And I think that you have, there's this belief in, in the sports world that Fox and ESPN are blood feud. It could not be further from the truth. They're partners on just about every sport. Do you, does that... Okay, what are the major sports in the United States of America? The National Football League. ESPN and Fox are partners on the National Football League. Okay, Monty, throw out the NFL. College football. They're partners on college football. Yeah. You look at Major League Baseball. Who's got the Major League Baseball package? Well, Fox and ESPN. The only thing they don't partner on is NBA. And with the new NBA deal coming up, some believe that Fox will bid on it. We'll see. ESPN and Fox are partners on just about everything. Including college basketball. Auto racing. Yeah. Like yeah. just about everything. 
They talk on a regular basis. And I, I continue to, and now people are confirming this, but who told you first? ESPN, Fox, CBS, NBC, they have regular calendar slated meetings where they communicate and they talk. And if you don't think that guys like Greg Sankey, Brett Yormark, Tony Petiti, Jim Phillips, yeah. these guys talk to their TV partners on a regular basis. When you renew a grant of rights or you expand and you add teams to your conference, you can't do that without opening up and amending your grant of rights. Why do you think George Klyovkov was such a problem? I, 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 there's this belief that TV is wanting to keep the status quo. TV doesn't want the status quo. TV wants what's good for TV. They want Caitlin Clark, right? They, they want big games and big matchups. They want, they want 20 million people on average watching a college basketball game. Yes. So you have to understand, and I'm not saying Dallin, you're wrong. It, the TV deal that they just signed does not mean that it's dead. And I, listen, Ross Dellinger is a hell of a lot better of a reporter than I am. I wholeheartedly disagree with him because people I talk to tell me to. They tell me, hey, it's not dead. It, it, it did not hurt our opportunity. The thing standing in the way is a bunch of dudes with huge egos. That's what's going to make this difficult to do. It's not the TV guys. The TV guys are going to get their money, period. Yeah, well, and that's why I think the private money piece is so important because, yes. again, it's not as the, the proposition isn't, you know, ESPN and Fox and CBS and all these TV networks just continuing to pay more. The, the proposition is, you know, figuring out how to balance the ecosystem because what you have at play now is the TV partners essentially funding athletics. And, and that is a very... Um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of risk in that situation. Whereas if you could have, you know, private money coming in and, and providing stability for the, the, the P and L sheet for colleges and, you know, a little bit for TV partners, that's going to really help the sport. And again, I always point this out. It, it would follow the NFL model. It would be, you know, Hey, wild card weekend is brought to you by. You know, this game is presented by, you know, the the coin toss is presented by, like, do you ever stop and watch an NFL game and and just take notice of how many things are monetized? Do you really think that's like an accident or not intentional? It's very intentional. The sport I would agree needs with that. that level of revenue to, to be able to continue to thrive. Because that's the difference between the NFL and college football. The NFL thrives every single year. But I but I also think we need to understand that TV money is not just some pipeline of cash. And much to Dallin's point, um, I think that TV, ESPN, Fox, CBS, NBC, it's not just some endless well of cash that they can just keep handing out. The private money part of this is critical that you have other money to fund this outside of TV money. Because I, I, I would agree that TV companies are not going to continue to just hand over more money because you asked them to. I that That's the part of this comment I agree with 100%. Money in the TV industry is not endless. But I think one of the things that is very clear here is ESPN and ABC are making a gob slobbering knob huge... 12 inch unit worth of cash right on college football they're they making are. the cac a lot of money it is profitable uh a lot you don't pay billions if you're not making tens of billions yes you 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 have to understand that but they're not in the position that they're in as behemoths of industry because they make they make deals that lose them money so that's why, why do you think that people are out trying to source private money and come in with frameworks that are built on top of private money in addition to TV money? Because TV is, I think the Pac-12 learned a very hard lesson and it cost them their lives. 
that money is not endless and you better have a value proposition. So don't tell me the Super League's dead. Don't tell me that 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 this concept and this conversation's dead because there's no way it's dead, dude. And I also think is I also think that it's interesting that the different models, and I think we've talked about this for months and months, the different models of the Super League, I mean, you you, you have to understand that months and months ago when people were like, oh, well, it's just going to be funded by TV, that was never going to work. And I think one of the other things that I think goes overlooked is this is why ESPN was pressing the college football playoff so hard to get the extension done. Yeah. Because I think they knew as soon as that extension was done that they were going to, they were going to regain control. They were going to have a lot more creative uh, and monetary control over college football when that deal got done. And I think they do. And mm-hmm. I think they've earned it because they perform. They perform. Uh, OG Gary, I'm here for the Super League. 72 teams, nine teams of eight divisions. I don't know that 72 is enough, and I think it might be too many. That's exactly what I just said. I think it's it's 70, it's 70. I mean, if you go to 48 teams, that's not nearly enough. That was the number that was originally floated. It's not nearly enough. Right. But once you get to 70, 84 teams, relegation, I don't know that relegation is a serious thing. I truly do not. I don't know how you how you make that work. The discrepancy in talent is too much. Yeah, I it, it's very difficult. Um, so I think that is that there's a lot of details that I think A, we don't know about, and B that I don't know how you would work them out. But I think when you look at 72. I don't know that that's enough, but man, that's a lot of teams. That is a lot of teams. And if we're in an NFL model, which I again continue to hear that people people are in favor of the NFL model. And I think I think they want a college football playoff championship on a Saturday and an NFL Super Bowl on a Sunday. Man, why wouldn't we, right? I, I mean, think you're going to see it. I think you're going to see it. Mike Smith, lots of big egos involved that could make it difficult to iron out all the details. That's right. Eric and Raleigh, TBS is going to buy the college football Super League and have the inside NBA guys do the studio show. Well, I think I mean, that's exactly dude, right. Why wouldn't they? I mean, we do that with everything else. Good Lord. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, RJC, man, I'll give you another chance. ACC has zero reason to negotiate with Florida State. Good to see you, my guy. Um, uh, Brandon Butler, the longer this takes, the less money ESPN, Fox, CBS don't have unlimited funds. They have to pay the pro sports leagues too. But I can tell you that these are all different departments. So if you have your NFL billions that are being paid to the NFL from ABC and ESPN, that is a different unit. There's a guy whose total job is to oversee the NFL at ESPN and ABC and execute the broadcast, then there's a guy whose job is to monetize it. Like you have all of this infrastructure for each one of their properties. So it's, it is at the end of the day, it all comes out of Bob Iger's checking account at Disney. But I also think ESPN is also painfully aware that they have to fund their direct to consumer model in 2025 that's about 18 months away. But, but make no mistake about it. ESPN's doing quite well. Like, they are doing like, well. Like, I don't want people to get this confused. Like, they all are separate departments, 100%, but they're all of the same mindset. Hey, if we're going to spend a dollar, we need to try to make seven or eight back. That's how you That's how you are profitable when you start building in, hey, got to pay Jimmy, got to pay Bob, got to pay Gary to do the broadcast and all these different things that you were just talking about. They got to pay staff. They got to pay the league. They got to pay all this stuff, but there's still 100%. profitability there. Yeah. And and that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, they're not just going to continue to pay infinite money, but they know how to sell. Totally agree. So they'll always be able to make money. Totally agree. hundred percent. Uh, Eric Wasikowski, this super league denial from you two, three months ago was impressive. Go back and find it and tell me we denied it. Eric, but always average to see you as well. All pro sports are scripted. Uh, Yes, ESPN and Fox are partners for the majority of all sports, but all sports are scripted and rigged. Okay. Okay. 
Are you the same guy that said the world was ending yesterday? The NFL is rigged. What happened to the colors on the Super Bowl logo then? How'd that work out? 66 teams seems like a good number. Brandon Butler, uh, the issue I have is that if you're not a university, if you're not in your university is going to be cutting a lot of sports because ESPN isn't going to pay the Mac or the G5s when they have to pay the Super League. I think there is, there are some unintended consequences that will result from this. There's no question about that. But again, maybe those schools shouldn't be on ESPN. I, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but but I'm going to say it. Yeah, maybe the tiny school that no one's ever heard of should be on a different network. And but but I also wonder how many kids are going to college because they love Clemson football. So they're going to Clemson. I think there's a lot of that. And I'm curious how many kids are going to Marshall because they love Marshall football. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know that about SMU. I don't know that about Lehigh. I don't know that about Hofstra. I don't know that about Boise State. Not sure about Fresno State. How many kids dream of going to Fresno State because David Carr went there? I don't know. But I think there's a enough of a number where it will make a difference. Right. And I do think that it this is the Gonzaga basketball argument. This is the UConn football argument. Nobody wants to subsidize UConn football or they'd be in a P5 right now. P4, excuse me. Rest in peace. Um, <laughs> you know, like I, I think it's a very relevant conversation. I, I think it's a very, that's a very poignant comment. I agree. UW fan Jim, uh, are the TV networks colluding to control the value of the deals and increase profits? Competition would do the opposite. I don't think that you can, I don't know if they're colluding. But how are you, how are you, Jimmy Pataro at ESPN? And you're insulating yourself from your competition. You can't do that. It doesn't work. You, you have to, on some level, have a relationship, if only so that there is an open line of communication, so that you have a strategic understanding, so that you know where your competition's going. It's why Tony Petiti and Greg Sankey have this unholy alliance, <laughs> right? It's why, because you're the two biggest behemoths in the room, you can crush each other, but you can also crush everyone else if you stick together. That's why you have relationships. I don't know that you, uh, there's no, there would be no other reason. You don't, you probably don't want, if you're ESPN, do you want Fox to thrive? I actually think you do. Because what's good for one is good for the other. Uh -huh. If Fox NFL is is suffering, do you really think that ESPN's better off for that? Because Fox going down the shithole doesn't mean that more people are watching ESPN, who only, I would remind you, has Monday Night Football in sporadic games in between. So are you telling me that ESPN and ABC want to see Fox fail? I don't think so. Are you telling me that Fox wants to see Sunday night football, have nobody watch it? I don't think so. That would be bad for everybody. Yeah. It'd be bad for everybody. It, this, this is the argument about what Greg Sankey has been evangelizing for years, and I've tried to, to tell people, and people don't want to hear it. Oh, the NCAA's got to go away. They're the bastards of the world. Well, the problem is that your favorite university is a member of the NCAA and has been part of the process of putting themselves in these NIL jackpots. Right. Like, so these, that this idea that, oh, there can be no regulation of college sports. Are you out of your mind? Have you thought through that? Oh, the NCAA is dying. Uh, the NCAA is dying financially because all of the member institutions, that means your favorite university, made bad, bad decisions to try and screw kids. Yes. I mean, leave Penn State out of this, but they tried to screw kids and take their money from them. Schemers they, trying to control their little worlds. A bunch of old white rich dudes wanted to keep the young black kids down. Yes. And Ed O'Bannon had had enough. That's where this comes from. So 
I would just encourage you to take your opinion and do some research on it and formulate an educated opinion. Because if you're rooting for the NCAA to die, Georgia and Alabama and Ohio State are going to be fine. Notre Dame is going to be fine. Can't say that about the, the lesser university. Can't say that about the girls' swim team. Can't say that about the track program or the cross-country team. Yeah. That's, that's what we're talking about. And if you don't believe that these NIL lawsuits that are coming down the pipe are not truly an existential crisis, you're not informed. You're not informed. You are not informed. Because they're not colluding. Colluding would be, you know, behind the scenes, under the table, let's let's screw college football. Yeah. No, they're openly talking and trying to figure out how to make more money and how to stave off the death of, of college athletics as we know it. And there's a way to do it. There is. There is. I don't think there's any doubt. So if 72 is too much, then they'll have to cut five teams and go to 64. I, I, I don't, I don't have a firm grasp because everybody's got a different idea. There are some TV executives who, who will tell you they want, they want 48 teams, period. That's it. 48's not enough. Do the simple math in the P4, 48 ain't going to cut it. Not going to happen. I think there is a loud c cry for people to miss the playoffs. That that bowl eligibility number was a comparison used when I was talking to a certain individual. There are a lot of people in college athletics who don't want everybody to make the playoffs every year. They shouldn't make the playoffs every year. That's why it's the playoffs. One of the major fights is, well, we want to make sure that everybody in the Big Ten makes the playoffs. Well, cool, but we don't give out participation trophies. That's one of the major arguments. Yeah. So how many teams get into the Super League is a different conversation than how many teams make the playoffs. Because not every team makes the playoffs. Every team, you can have 84 teams, 72, as Gary said. You can have them in the Super League. How many teams make the playoffs? I think that might be the 48 number. So how many make the playoffs versus how many are in the league? That's two different numbers. And I think that's part of this conversation. No doubt about it. Uh, Mike Smith, Eric uh, has imaginary arguments in his head and thinks they were real things others said. There's medication for that. All pro sports are scripted. Right. ESPN could just pull money from the movie studios if needed. No, it doesn't really work that way. That's not how, how things are set up. But again... I would encourage you to go and well, Monty, gain DeSantis some understanding. was going to win over Disney, and that means there was less money in the movie department. I encourage you to. The movie department, A, doesn't have a lot of money because of COVID. And B, I would, in, I would encourage you to go and look at the way that Bob Iger came in and restructured and put back in place from his previous regime at Disney. And if you look at the way, and I know I keep saying this, and nobody wants to listen to little old Monty. Oh, Monty. They have business units. ESPN is a business unit of the Walt Disney Company. As our theme parks, as our destination and travel, all these different business units, movies, streaming, enter Disney Entertainment, right? ESPN. Is it reaching into anybody else's bank account to pay for football? And they don't need to. It doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. It didn't. Um, you know, it, it is. Uh, Chrissy, ESPN is profitable uh, for Disney. I don't think Disney funnels money to sustain it. ESPN is self-sustaining on its own. Yes. I agree. I would agree with that. Lee Jensen, good morning, guys. I hope everyone has the best day of their lives today. Me too. Well, dude, you know, the hard part is, is there's no eclipse today. So, the you know, the risk of the world ending isn't at play today. So, you know, today seems a little more well, chill. Jeremiah has brought clarity and normalcy. I wish you wouldn't do that. Uh, you're asking people to do their own research and come up with their own opinion. I think you might be asking too much of <laughs> the general population. <laughs> you know, uh, here goes Monty uh, White against black, old people against young people. It There's no question in my mind that that's the reality of 
of how we got to where we are in college sports. I, I have, I yeah. have no doubt that the old white heads that were rich conspired with each other, in my opinion, to keep young black athletes in college athletics from prospering. And I don't mind saying that. And if that, I, we don't play the race card much on this show, but I don't think this is playing the race card. This is the reality of the history of college athletics. Yes. Yes. And were white athletes prevented from, you know, capitalizing? Yes, they were. But overwhelmingly, you look at who the real victims are in the history of college athletics. Why do you think there is such a thing as historically black colleges, HBCUs? Yeah. Do you not look at the racial disparity? Do we not look at, I, I, I'm like, you look at the history of sports, look at the NFL, look at college football, look at college basketball. It's very clear. It's very clear. Uh, this, it, like, this isn't playing the race card, man. Um, that's not the case. The issue is the NCAA is a monopoly, and with no competition, they run rough shot over everyone. Right, but you got to go a level deeper. It's because of the monopoly <laughs> that they're doing exactly what he's saying they're doing. That's why they can do it. It's not mutually they have exclusive. The control. Yeah, it's not mutually exclusive. Right, one can be true as the other can be true. So. Uh, Brandon Butler, Disney and Warner Brothers are still cutting costs. Paramount might be declaring bankruptcy. Movie and media studios are scrambling to get their books in line. Yes, they are. I would agree. Derek Roche, uh, a super conference should have relegation to keep it interesting. Yeah, I think the problem is, is relegation requires the level of talent to be uh, somewhat, you know, even. Derek Roche, it's my birthday. Well, okay, happy. see, I, I'm Are not... we going the Mike Smith route here now on the show? Don't lie to me. It's my birthday, bro. Derek, as Derek. a Utah fan, I can't 100% believe you, bro. Can't 100% believe you. Is it actually your birthday? Or are you just saying that to get attention? Cam Rising has been getting some rave reviews, by the way. Yeah, good for him. Show me you can stay healthy. Uh, Mountain Mama says, they even said back then that some call it Super League, but they call it God tier. Do, do you just try to be contrarian because you're too bound up? I mean, you should have some fiber. You know, uh, Brandon Butler, damn it. I missed the end of the eclipse in the end of the world. I will have to catch the next one. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, how, it's... how, what did you guys think of the end of the world yesterday? You know, I always had to be negative. How was it for you? Cause for me, it was pretty chill. But... Anybody heard from MTG this morning? Like Marjorie? Yeah. Hey, hey, Marge. Cause God sent the eclipse. Did you do repenting yesterday? Did you do sinning yesterday? Did you still trying to unseat that speaker? Yeah. Again? Are you still you still wearing the the hat? What an embarrassment. I, I just dude. think it's funny. The idea that they're trying to unseat buddy is embarrassing. I I just think it's it's a whole interesting thing. And you know, uh 1939 woke BS these kids got free education the free education. Okay, so wait. Let me let me just see. If, let, the old whiteheads get to keep the billions, but these kids with their lifelong brain injuries and their physical limitations, and they get their education. They get a free education. Do you know for how long in this country kids got free education but couldn't fucking afford to eat? You ever thought about that? Oh, they got that free education, Monty. Do you know how many kids that came to colleges in this country in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s? Do you know how many of those kids were not allowed to take but one sandwich from the training table? <laughs> because it's a, it's a violation of NCAA rules if you take two. You think I'm joking. Do you know how many kids in that are college athletes in that time period could not afford to pay rent, to buy food, but they got their education for free? Do you have any idea what you're talking about? You, like, do you have any idea? No, he doesn't. You, you like this? This statement right here is what's wrong. With they got their free education, they should just be happy to be here. 
Yeah, and as soon as you start using the word woke, I know exactly who you are. Come on. Like, you're out of your the mind. The idiots always expose themselves. You are out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Um, Chrissy, what education? Coaches force kids to take East uh, weaving degrees and, and focus on sports to make coaches millions. I'd also remind you, um, we went through a period in this country where coaches could, without any repercussions, tell a kid, I'm taking your scholarship, you're fucked. I sold cars back in the day in 1995-ish. A bunch of dudes I worked with were Notre Dame football players and cheerleaders. And this one particular kid, I went to high school with him. And he had a scholarship to Notre Dame to play football. Yeah. And he did play football at a very high level and played in the NFL. And my guy was a porter at this car dealership I worked at during the summers. And I believe he came back summer and winter break, Christmas, any chance he got, he came back and he worked. Now, I will also candidly tell you that this cat was paid very well to be a porter. But do you know how many lunches I bought that cat? Do you know how many times that the the general manager of the this car dealership, when that kid was working in our store, because his parents, his parents, his dad was a public school teacher, and his mom in that school district um, was a tutor and a bus driver. Didn't make a lot of money. And so this kid would come back. And when he was in the store working as a porter, which means he washes cars, parks cars. Like, I mean, the, the, I can tell you the memories I have of this kid, like backing backing this particular vehicle off of a car carrier. Amazing. The vehicle. Really good dude too. But he was broke as man. Like he was broke. So every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, the general manager would bring in like, I want to say it was like 50 pizzas. And this kid would regularly take the leftover pizza and they ordered so much pizza for this exact reason. He would take the leftover pizza and put it in uh, these little like paper, not like brown lunch bags. They were a little bigger than that. But he was taking the pizza home and he would freeze the pizza and then take it back to his dorm at Notre Dame and microwave it. And that would feed him for several weeks. And I can also tell you that he would eat like the worst shit, like bags of uh, Jay's potato. Chicago had a brand of potato chip called Jay's potato chips, white bags with like a blue circle on it. Yeah. He would get just boxes of those. He's playing football at Notre Dame, living on frozen pizza that was made like regular home delivery pizza, call it Domino's or whatever. It was a, a place called Rosati's. But he would, so good. he would freeze Rosati's pizza in paper bags and cook that stuff. And then on top of that, he would be eating like Jay's potato chips, top ramen. Oh, but he got his education paid for. Come on, dude. Like, if you don't understand that, like, do you, do you get that his parents, like this kid that was a cheerleader that I sold cars with at Notre Dame, he only got a 50% scholarship to be a cheerleader, a football cheerleader. At Notre Dame, his parents found ways to pay for his, like they took second mortgages. He was on the, he was on the, the pizza plan as well. Like, do you understand how difficult it had been up until NIL to just pay for college? Because you think every kid is on scholarship on football. They're not. Do you know how many walk-ons he had to figure out if they could afford to be a walk-on? It's crazy. Dude, 
you're out of your mind. You are out of your mind if you think that kids prospered because they got their education. You're out of your mind. It just is, is, I don't mean to go on about it, but Richard McDonald, uh, look at Luke Staley. He still has all kinds of insane health problems from his college playing years. It literally affects his whole life and family, but at least he got his free education. You have no idea. It's such a gimmick, dude. And especially in the 90s and 2000s, how much damage was done to bodies. Now it's very different. By the way, the concept of free education is trash in and of itself because you're (laughs) you're, you're, you're treating it like they're like, all right, hey, here's your diploma. You don't have to study or grind or write papers or do any. Like, it's nothing's free, dude. You're, you're, you're okay. Maybe they didn't pay a dollar, but they damn sure paid their time. I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about so many. I, I went to, I went to school with some really good baseball players. I, so I almost went to the university of Illinois to play baseball. Those cats got 25% of their, uh, scholarship. They got a 25% scholarship and I can vividly remember because we, we, they would come home. And we would play summer ball together all summer long. Like I played baseball probably until I was competitive, hundred dollar a game, semi pro baseball in Kenosha, Wisconsin. For man, it must have been nineteen ninety six or so, nineteen ninety four, ninety five, ninety six. So, like all through my college age. And dude, I cannot tell you how many of those kids would come home from being baseball players at at the university of Illinois with spikes falling off the bottom of their, their cleats. Cause they, you got one pair of spikes for the, you got one pair of spikes. And this friend of mine, Mark, who was a phenomenal left-handed right fielder that had a rifle for an arm. I will never forget that cat sleeping on the apartment floor of, I had an apartment in Libertyville, Illinois. This cat slept on my floor and he loved nothing more than peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for breakfast. We would go and play baseball. I would go work at at the time I was waiting tables at Olive Garden. So we would go play our games he would he would go and landscape in his neighborhood major college baseball player knocking on doors cutting lawns in the in i i want to say oh my god kevin i kevin kevin i can't remember kevin's last name my one of my neighbors kevin in libertyville down the street pulled his car up to the front yard so Mark could finish cutting that lawn because he needed that money. And you know what he did with his money? He stuck it in a, a uh, one of those long tube socks. He never spent his yard money. Never, ever spent his yard money because he needed that to get through the baseball season. He needed that to get through the school year at Illinois. Yeah. And you think that they they lived well they don't live well they to the now today they live better the top five percent of college athletes live better there's no kate and clark lives better than anybody else before but any i could go on yeah i could go on i i truly it's wild to me brandon butler ask kyle gunther sometimes how poor the urban meyer teams at utah you want stories ask kyle gunther about urban meyer and what urban the things that urban meyer would say to his players and the amount of food that those kids had to eat. Gunther's got stories. How many of those dudes on that team were struggling to afford Rauman? Yeah. How many? I Well, fuck, the best story ever. Um, a, a, a friend of mine it, from a, an affluent neighborhood. This is an even better story. So for the first two years of my high school life, I went to a school called Adelaide Stevenson High School in Lincolnshire, Illinois. Mm-hmm. And this kid, another another major college football player, and at our favorite University of Michigan to boot. So this kid is a phenomenal linebacker. And we're at a pretty affluent school. Like we, 
we all did pretty well. It was a well-to-do area. Just going through life. You know, like we're going to a football game on a Friday night. I will never forget this story. Jeez Louise. Football game on Friday night. Um, a bunch of a bunch of our guy friends, we all went to the football games and then we would usually go to somebody's um house and hang out or do whatever. Well, this linebacker who was in our friends group didn't show up. And we we're like, damn, I wonder what happened. Saturday, Sunday, go back to school on Monday. He's not in school. Hmm. Wonder what happened. Don't have cell phones at that point. It's like 1988, 89. Right. Tuesday, the kid comes back to school. You know why he wasn't in school on Monday and we didn't see him Friday night? He got caught stealing from Jewel Osco, the grocery store. And it it was one of the best moments of my high school life that he got arrested for stealing, shoplifting. And you know why he got sh- arrested shoplifting? Because his, his family's broke. And we didn't know it. Nobody, you're just kids living your life, right? You think because you have a riding lawnmower, they have a riding lawnmower. Right. Yeah, it turns out that wasn't the case. They didn't have money. He didn't have food. And he got caught stealing from Jewel Osco. And, and the best part of it is, I, as, you're going to think this is weird. Rice pudding. You guys know what rice pudding is? So they had rice pudding with cinnamon on top of it. At, at Jewel Osco, it was amazing. This cat in our friends group loved that rice pudding and he got caught trying to steal a container of it. And what else did he steal? Twinkies and Top Ramen. The food that's easy to eat, cheap, and he got caught shoplifting. Yeah. And it was great. And the reason I say it was great because everybody came together. Like the community came together around that kid um, he wound up not, I, if I'm memory serves, I don't believe he got in any trouble. He went on to play football at Michigan and I don't know whatever happened to him. I, 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 he's one of those kids I didn't keep in touch with, but went on to play football at Michigan and it was one, it was a crazy, crazy story, dude. Like kids in college at that point, man, kids just didn't have prosperity. Didn't have prosperity, but man, that Jewel Osco rice pudding was worth it. That shit was good. <laughs> that was that stuff, man. I'm telling you, that stuff, that stuff was really good. Oh wow, it's ten after. We got to roll. Yeah, out of time. Sorry to go story time on you, but dude, it's crazy, man. I'm telling you, the misconceptions of the old hats. Well, they got their education, Monty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. While they, they, they were starving, in the process. While they were starving. Yeah. While they were starving. Crazy. All right. The Monty Show, as always, is presented by our good friends at The Advocates, theadvocates.com. The best injury attorneys in the business. Speaking of hunger, they are working with uh, the Murray Children's Pantry to end childhood hunger. If you weren't here on Giving Friday last Friday, we raised $1,000 for them. If you want to donate, you want to get in, do it right there. Advocates donations on Venmo. You want to shout us out in your Venmo memo section? Five dollars, a hundred dollars, a million dollars, whatever you have. The advocates on Venmo, advocates donations. Until tomorrow, say goodbye, Jake. Goodbye, Jake.